Well, please have your Bibles open in front of you at that passage we read just a moment ago earlier in our service in Philippians and chapter 1. So last time we began a new series looking at this letter to the Philippians, this new book of the New Testament, this letter written by the Apostle Paul and also by Timothy, his fellow servant in Christ Jesus, and it's written to all the saints, to all the believers, to all the Christians who are part of the church in Philippi. Now, last time we looked at the opening two verses. Uh, we looked at the use of the word servants, the use of the word uh, saints, and we looked at the salutation that Paul gives. Well, this evening I want us to look deeper into chapter one. This evening I want us to focus on verses three. To six, verses three to six, and the title for this evening's sermon is Three Sure Signs of True Faith. Three Sure Signs of True Faith. Now, if you remember last time when we looked at the background to this letter to the Philippians, we thought about the culture of the city of Philippi. The city of Philippi was very conscious, very proud of its Greek heritage. It was named Philippi after King Philip II of Macedon, and he was the father of Alexander the Great, who, at the time that Alexander the Great was alive, was just the greatest empire builder the world had ever seen. And the city of Philippi was so proud of its links to Philip II and Alexander the Great. But then came the Roman Empire and Octavian, when he was vying to be emperor, he won a decisive battle outside Philippi. And uh, he became Caesar Augustus. And he gave lands around Philippi to his generals. And he made Philippi a Roman colony. And all the people of Philippi were proud of that too. In fact, they considered themselves more Roman than the Romans. They took it very seriously. They were proud of their, their past glory and their success and all the honor that they had. And the city of Philippi then was dominated by these, these twin values, the values of ancient Greece, the values of the Roman Empire. And to be a resident of the city of Philippi was to embrace these values of honor, glory, power, status, pride. These values were the sure signs that you were a Philippian, that you were born in or had become a citizen of the city of Philippi. But Paul writes to these Christians in Philippi with an entirely different set of values. At no time does Paul ever encourage the Christians to celebrate the culture of Philippi. On the contrary, Paul urges them to resist the culture of the city and to show the values of the kingdom of God. For you are a citizen of heaven. You belong to Christ. And how can you tell? How can you tell whether someone does truly belong to the kingdom of heaven? How can you tell whether a person is genuinely a citizen of the celestial city? Well, ultimately, only God can answer those questions because only God can look into your heart. I can't look into your heart. You can't look into each other's hearts. You can't look into my heart. Only Christ can do that. Only Christ knows the ultimate answer to that. But in the scriptures, he does give us a number of signs a number of indicators, a number of standards by which we can benchmark or test whether someone has truly come to faith. And there are three of those signs here in these opening verses of the letter to the Philippians. Now these three are by no means an exhaustive list, nor am I necessarily saying that these three are the most important indicators of true conversion. But these are the verses we're looking at this evening. And I wanted to show you these three signs of true faith. 
And these three signs are going to be our three headings this evening. First of all, true faith is shown in prayerfulness. Prayerfulness. And then secondly, we see that true faith is shown in partnership. In partnership. And then thirdly, true faith is shown in perseverance. In perseverance. They are the three signs here in these verses of true conversion, of true faith, prayerfulness, partnership, and perseverance. So let's look at these this evening. First of all, true faith is shown in prayerfulness. Now just look at verses 3 and 4. Just read verse 3 and verse 4 again with me. And in verse 3 and 4, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Now from this one statement alone, it is obvious that a life of true faith is shown in a life that is full of prayerfulness. The Apostle Paul was a mighty man of faith and he was also a mighty man of prayer. There are 150 references to prayer in the New Testament and in the whole of the Bible, prayer is mentioned hundreds of times. In fact, I don't think you could find a book of the Bible where prayer is not spoken about or demonstrated or commanded or instructed. I don't think you can think of any great character from biblical history who was not also a person of prayer. The 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon said this about prayer. He said, the very act of prayer is a blessing. And he said, to pray is to enter the treasure house of God and gather riches out of an inexhaustible storehouse. And the 17th century Puritan John Bunyan, he said, pray often. For prayer is a shield to the soul. It is a sacrifice to God. And it is a scourge to Satan. And Matthew Henry, a nonconformist minister of a similar era, he said, you may as soon find a living man who does not breathe as a living Christian who does not pray. Question 98 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is this. What is prayer? What is prayer? What is it? How would you answer that question? Well, the Westminster Catechism answers it in this way. Prayer is the offering up of our desires to God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and with thankful acknowledgement for all his mercies. And the catechism goes on with a follow-up question. It says, well, what rule has God given for our direction in prayer? To which it answers this. The whole word of God is of use to direct us in prayer. But the special rule of direction is the form of prayer that Christ taught to his disciples commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And that very fact, the very fact that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, shows just how fundamental prayer is in the Christian life. You know, just like a newborn baby, as soon as it's delivered, starts crying out for its mother. So a child of God, as soon as he is born again into newness of life, has an instinctive, intuitive, innate desire to cry out to God from his heart. He may not know the right words to say. He may not know how to do it. But he has a desire for it. And if that desire is not there, then there's something wrong. Just as if a newborn baby, when it's delivered, doesn't cry out for its mother, there's something wrong. It is a sure sign of true faith that you desire prayerfulness. A Christian who never prays is like a baby that never cries out for its mother. So it's no wonder then that as Paul writes this letter to the Christians in Philippi, 
He begins by saying, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. The Apostle Paul was a man of prayer. And we learn a lot about prayer from how Paul prayed in these verses, in his opening to the letter to the Philippians. For one thing, we learn that he prayed with thankfulness. That's what Paul says, first of all. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. The Apostle Paul was grateful in his prayers. He showed his appreciation for all the blessings that God had given to him. His prayers were not immediately a list of groans and complaints and protests and objections. No, Paul's prayers were full of thankfulness. And for another thing, Paul's prayers were directed towards God. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Now that might sound like an obvious point to make. Of course our prayers are to, towards God. I mean, who else would they be directed to? But yet, there are many Christians who when they do pray, if they are praying to God, they forget that that's who they're speaking to. They forget that they're communing with the Lord and they forget to pray with reverence and with awe as well as with childlike trust and childlike affection. And very often they're not praying to God at all, they're praying horizontal prayers, aren't they? For you to hear. It's not directed to God at all. But not only were Paul's prayers filled with thankfulness not only were they directed towards God but his prayers were offered in remembrance of others Paul says I thank my God in all my remembrance of you in other words Paul doesn't just pray for himself when he prays he doesn't just pray for the things he's doing or the mission that he's on or the worries that he has or the blessings that he has received. Now I'm sure Paul did pray for all of those things. But he also prayed for others. He prayed for other people. He remembered other Christians when he prayed. And in addition to all of that. In addition to Paul's thankfulness. And in addition to Paul directing his prayers to God. And in addition to Paul remembering others in his prayers. It is obvious that Paul prayed repeatedly. He prays frequently. He prays habitually. Paul says in verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine for you all. In other words, Paul didn't just pray for the Philippians once or twice. He prayed for them often. He prayed for them again and again. He prayed for them time after time after time. And to round it all off, Paul says, and his prayers for the Philippians were filled with joy. Just look at how verse 4 ends. Just read the end of verse 4 with me. And at the end of verse 4, Paul says, making my prayer with joy. Paul's prayers were filled with happiness and with gladness. Now that's not to say that Paul's prayers were never filled with any sorrow or any pain. That's not to say Paul's prayers were never filled with grief or with agony. We know that they were. We can read some of his other prayers in the New Testament. But when it comes to Paul's prayers for these Christians in Philippi, he prayed with joy. Do you see? Prayerfulness is a sure sign of true faith. So let me ask you this evening, is your life a life of prayer? Are you praying, at least on a daily basis? You know, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught his disciples to say, Give to us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. And that presupposes that we should pray at the very least, at the very minimum, every day. Are you doing that? 
Are you a person of prayer? Are you a person of daily prayer? And when you do pray, are your prayers filled with thankfulness? Are you conscious that you're speaking to God Almighty? Are you praying for other people, for other Christians? And are you expressing your joys to the Lord as well as your hardships? Let me just remind you of those words of Matthew Henry one more time. You may as soon find a living man who does not breathe as a living Christian who does not pray. That's the first sign of true faith that emerges from these verses in the beginning of this letter to the Philippians. True faith is shown in prayerfulness. But now secondly, we also see from these verses that true faith is shown in partnership. It's shown in partnership. Just look at verse 5. Just read verse 5 with me. And in verse 5, Paul shows why his prayers for the Christians in Philippi are filled with joy. Why he is so thankful for them. In verse 5, he says, Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. <clears throat> It is because of their partnership. And when Paul says partnership, he means it in terms of fellowship. It is the same Greek word that is often translated as fellowship. Paul is emphasizing the, the close association that he has with the Christians in Philippi and they with him. Paul is emphasizing the things they have in common uh, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one hope. They all share in these things. They participate in these things together. They contribute in these things together. There is a togetherness about them. Even though they may be separated by hundreds of miles and separated by chains. These Christians are not isolated individuals. They're not cloistered loners who cut themselves off from everyone. They're not solitary mavericks who just go off and do their own thing. And they're not divided. They're not separated from one another. They're not split off from one another. No, they are committed to one another. They are united to one another. They're joined to one another. They've devoted themselves to fellowship. They are in partnership, says Paul. And that's why I pray for you with such joy, because you are my partners. And they are partners in the gospel. In the gospel. That's what Paul says in verse 5. He says that they have a partnership in the gospel. You see, their partnership is not based upon the fact that they all share the same ethnic background. For they are not. Some of them are Jewish. Some of them are Gentile. And their partnership is not based upon the same economic background. Some of them are wealthy. Some of them were poor. And their partnership is not based upon the same gender. Some of them were men. Some of them were women. No, their partnership is based upon the gospel. It's based upon the gospel. But what does Paul mean by this word gospel? What is the gospel? It is literally the good news. You know, in the ancient world, when there was a major victory that had been won on the battlefield, you couldn't just post a video to YouTube. You couldn't just send out a press release. When a major battle had been won on the battlefield, a messenger had to be dispatched to go and declare the gospel. Declare the good news. And the messenger would run. And would herald this good news of victory wherever he went. That is gospel. Well what is the good news that Paul is referring to? What battle has been won? What victory has been achieved? Well Paul is talking about the ultimate. Eternal cosmic victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over sin and over death. Paul is speaking about the good news of salvation. The good news of all your sins forgiven. The good news of eternal hope in Christ. And that is the gospel. And it is in that gospel that the Christians in Philippi are in partnership with Paul. 
They have fellowship in the gospel. They have unity together in the gospel. They are together in the gospel. Committed to one another in the gospel. It is the gospel that unites them. It is the gospel that binds them. It is the gospel that fuses them together one to another. And this partnership that Paul speaks of, this partnership that brings him such tremendous joy, is no momentary thing. It is not just temporary. It is not merely here today and gone tomorrow. No, Paul says this partnership is enduring. Look again at the end of verse 5. Just read the end of verse 5. And at the end of verse 5, Paul speaks of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. From the first day until now. In other words, this partnership in the gospel has existed between Paul and these Christians in Philippi since the very first day. Meaning the very first moment that this church in Philippi was established. We're talking about the days when Lydia, this businesswoman who sold purple goods, was converted. She'd heard of God. She worshipped God. She feared God. But she'd never heard of Christ. And Paul preached Christ to her. And her heart was opened. And she received the gospel. And we're talking about the day when the Apostle Paul <coughs> rescued that slave girl from her oppressors. And we're talking about the moment that that Philippian jailer fell on his knees to Paul and to Silas and said, What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And how that jailer then took Paul and Silas into his own home and healed their wounds. And Paul preached the gospel to the whole household and the whole household believed and was baptized. From that very day until now they have been partners in the gospel perpetually, unceasingly, continually in partnership in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A desire for fellowship with other Christians is a true and sure sign of genuine faith. From the very earliest days of the New Testament church, it, it, it is a hallmark of Christianity. You know, you can, you can tell a genuine silver item by its hallmark, stamped into it. Or well, stamped into every Christian ought to be a desire for fellowship with other believers. You remember in the book of Acts, after Peter preached at Pentecost, and after thousands of people were convicted of their sin and cried out for salvation and were converted, what does it tell us? What does it tell us in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 2 verse 42. Some of you know this verse off by heart. And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship. And the breaking of bread and prayers. They devoted themselves to fellowship. This theme of partnership, of fellowship in the gospel... It is a major theme of the letter to the Philippians. So that in chapter 2 of the letter to the Philippians we read this. Paul says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any partnership, any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection, any sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Having the same mind love being in full accord and of one mind that's Paul's desire for these Philippians that they should be in peaceful harmonious fellowship in the gospel in the love of Christ and this commitment this devotion to fellowship is something that is increasingly at odds with our modern culture. For we live in a modern culture, a modern society that emphasizes individual freedom. Individuality 
and personal choice. These are the hallmarks of our modern Western culture. Consumerism has created a society where every single aspect of your life can be customised to meet your particular needs, your particular wants, your particular comforts. There's hardly anything left in the world that you can't customise to meet your specific needs. And that same mindset then can sneak into a church. In fact, I would say this mindset has come flooding into many churches. And there are so-called Christians today who say that they've been saved, who say that they have been born again, who say that they love Jesus Christ, but they have zero interest. Zero interest in fellowship with other Christians. Instead, they stay at home. They watch sermons on the internet. They browse around until they, they find the right sermon that will tickle their ears. Or if they do come to church, they treat the church like a, like a petrol station. It was Walter who used this analogy a few weeks ago, and I think it hits the nail right on the head. There are Christians who treat the church as nothing more than a petrol station. They call in when they feel like their spiritual tank is running low. And they stay for a brief moment as they fill it up. They fill up their spiritual tank, but then they're off again. Off on their own journey. Is that how the New Testament speaks of the church? The church is no petrol station. It is no stop-off point. The church is a family. <clears throat> If you've been saved from your sins, then you've been adopted into God's family. And if you have received adoption, then your fellow Christians are your brothers. And they are your sisters. And you don't treat them like they're just a stop-off point. You're all members of one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. And any Christian who demotes the importance of fellowship in a local church is effectively saying precisely that. He is effectively saying, I have no need of you. Here in Philippians chapter 1 verse 5, the Apostle Paul is absolutely clear. We are partners in the gospel. We all need fellowship in the gospel. It is an indispensable part of the Christian life. And I'm greatly concerned. Because it has been wonderful over the last few months to see many, many people coming into our church. Many new faces, many new visitors. And I welcome them all and we're all delighted to see them. But they dip in and they dip out. And then they dip in and dip out somewhere else. And they may dip in and dip out on the internet. And then they find somewhere new to go. That is not fellowship. That is not partnership in the gospel. So let me ask you tonight. Is fellowship with other Christians an indispensable part of your Christian life? Are you devoted to fellowship in the gospel? Are you committed to partnership in the gospel? The Apostle Paul needed partnership in the gospel. It brought him such great joy. And if the Apostle Paul needed partners in the gospel, then believe me, there is no one here tonight that says, or can say, I have no need of you. Tonight, we're looking at Philippians chapter 1 verses 3 to 6 and we're looking at these three sure certain signs of true faith and the first is that true faith will always lead to prayerfulness secondly true faith will lead to a desire for partnership and thirdly and finally true faith will lead to perseverance 
It will lead to perseverance. Just look at verse 6 now. Just read verse 6 with me. And in verse 6 it says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now the Apostle Paul is speaking of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, or sometimes called the preservation of the saints, which is to say that once a person has truly been made alive in Christ, once they've truly been converted from their life of sin, once they are genuinely trusting in Jesus, they will continue trusting in Christ all the way to the end, all the way to the end of their life. And this teaching is not just found here. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, that is to say, when the word of truth came to you and made you alive, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of your inheritance. If you're truly saved, then you have been sealed with the Spirit and your inheritance cannot be taken from you. Or listen to the words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 10, verses 27 to 29. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Once you have come to faith in Christ. You are placed into his hand. And his hand is powerful and there is no power in this world or outside of this world that can snatch you out of his hand. And here in Philippians chapter 1, Paul says he is sure of it. I am sure of it. He is absolutely certain about this. Completely convinced. There is no shred of doubt in Paul's mind. He is totally confident. And why, why is Paul so convinced that the Christians in Philippi will be preserved to the end? Is it because there is something special about these Christians in Philippi? I just know that they'll make it in the end. Is it because they're super religious? Of all the churches that Paul has established, the, the church in Philippi, they're super religious. Is it because they're extra devout? Is it because they're stronger? Is it because they're more committed than anyone else? It's none of those things, is it? We only have to read what he says. Look at what Paul says in verse 6. He says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Paul's confidence is in the Lord. It is the Lord who has begun this good work in them, and it is the Lord that will complete it. It is the Lord who will finish it. It is the Lord who will fulfill it. But hang on a minute. I know many, many, many people who once declared themselves to be a faithful follower of Christ. I know, and you know, many, many people who once happily called themselves a Christian. But they've since fallen away. And they no longer go to church. And they no longer read their Bibles. They no longer say their prayers. In fact, some of them are vehemently atheistic now. So how do we square that with what Paul is saying? How can we know so many people who have fallen away when Paul says it'll never happen? Well, what does the Apostle John say in his first letter? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, the Apostle John says... They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain 
that they all are not of us. In other words, yes, there are people who seem to be true believers on the outside. And they may have us fooled for many years. They may even have fooled themselves. They may have convinced themselves that it was all true. That they really believed it. But the very fact that they fall away shows that their faith was never genuine, never real in the first place. For if they had truly belonged to us, they would have stayed with us. And it is one of the sure signs of true faith that a person perseveres all the way to the end. It fills my heart with joy to see you out here tonight. And I praise God that you are trusting in the Saviour. I praise God that you have your Bibles open in front of you and you call yourself a Christian. But where will you be in six months time? Where will you be in a year? Where will you be in five years? Where will you be in 20 years? And where will you be when you draw your final breath? When you breathe your last breath on this earth, where will you be? The hymn writer Charles Wesley wrote, Happy if with my latest breath I might but gasp his name preach him to all and cry in death behold behold the lamb if you truly belong to christ you will make it all the way to the end the apostle paul said i'm sure of this that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of jesus christ that's one of the marks of a true christian it's one of the marks of a true believer one of the marks of a true child of God is that you persevere and you persevere because of the Lord because the Lord preserves you he finishes the work in you ultimately it is a work of God ultimately it is a work of the sovereign almighty Lord and creator of all things he is the one who keeps you secure in his hand but like so many things in the Bible, there is also a responsibility that's placed upon you. You must run the race. You must endure the hardships. You must complete the pilgrimage. So let me ask you tonight, are you persevering? Are you persevering with your faith? Keep going. Keep going. Take it one day at a time. Plod along if you have to, but make sure you walk every day with the Lord. Keep running the race. You must persevere. You must press on. You must be persistent. You must keep going all the way to the finishing line. These are the three sure signs of true faith prayerfulness partnership perseverance are these three signs evident in your life let's pray Lord God and our loving heavenly father we confess tonight that very often we're slow to come into your presence and to pray Give us a desire for prayerfulness. Father, we ask that you will teach us how to pray. That we might learn from you. Learn from your example. That we might consider you in the Garden of Gethsemane as we were considering this morning. That we might see your prayerfulness and see our need to pray ourselves. And Father, give us a desire for true fellowship, true partnership in the gospel with one another. Help us never to think, never even to imagine that we can say, I have no need of them. Father, we need each other. You have placed us in fellowship with our brothers and sisters. So give us a desire for it, we pray. And Lord, 
we ask that you will help us to persevere. You have started a work in us. We pray that you will bring it to completion. And we ask that in all these things that we might be built up in our most holy faith and that you will be honoured, that you will be glorified. And we ask it all in our Saviour's name. Amen.